Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Far Post podcast presented by Esports Gaming League. Almost forgot the name of the show. You probably thought that you'd finally gotten rid of us after 355 episodes because this is our first show since last November. But uh, reports of our demise have been greatly exaggerated. We're still here. (laughs) I'm just lazy. That's basically what it comes down to. Uh, The show is not gone. The show still exists. I was just too lazy to put together an outline for the past three months. I've been sleeping a lot. Uh, I finally woke up. I'm refreshed. So ready to go for the 2022 season. It's the weirdest thing. I kept tapping you at your desk and you just kept sleeping. I don't know. I'm like a hibernator. It was like an off-season hibernation thing. Took a quick nap. Knew that I was going to be waking up every five minutes or so just to eat and go straight back to sleep. Uh, So now I'm back to sleeping like only like 16 hours a night. No, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Just it is. That it, much sleep. It, was, it was great. You avoid the whole winter that way. It's nice. I heard a stat, actually, which is random, but you sleep for a third of your life, which makes sense. But when you think about it like that, it's it's like 27 years or something. Yeah, it's also time. not enough. It, it is not enough. I could I sleep for 27 enough. years and still be tired. <laughs> the same right. time, you're like, wow, I wish I had all that time. I don't know. I don't know. You could stay up if you wanted to. You could. But you would just be... then die earlier because yeah. you'd be exhausted. Yeah. It's a give and take. It's life. We get one next optimism right back on the Far Post podcast. <laughs> if you try to stay up, you'll just die. I yeah, don't do that. All right. Well, uh, the podcast is back. Cahal isn't uh, because he's just busy. I don't know. I don't know what he's got. I don't I never heard, know what he's doing. I heard he doesn't like you. I yeah, I never know what he's doing back there. Uh, but look, we're here. I'm Jeff Lemieux, back for a 356th episode, which is too many episodes. It's too many years. Um, hey, we got cheers. Wow. Yeah, you know, it's it's that that start of the season optimism. You know, no no booing yet. A little something different. Yeah. We're joined by Elizabeth Pahoda. Hello, everybody. Happy to be back. (laughs) And Jason Dowrymple. Hey, hey. Yeah, what's going on? Not too much. I don't have any cool sounds for either of us. No, that's fine. That's all right. If anyone's going to have a cool sound, if only one person's going to have a cool sound, it should be me. That's for sure. Uh, Hey, crazy times we're living in right now. So I'm just happy to see everybody happy and healthy. I can't confirm that Kahal is happy and healthy because he's not here. I assume he is. Um, we'll just uh, we'll just assume that everybody's everybody's happy. Well, healthy. not exactly like that. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know uh, Cahal's personal life, but uh, <laughs> this look. This is our first show since since our playoff preview last November. Our guests on the last show we had was Teal Bunbury, uh, who now plays for Nashville SC. So that gives you a sense for how long ago our last show was. It was uh, his birthday the other day. It was his birthday the other day. Um, oh. Wow. Still getting used to seeing him in Nashville colors. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. It's a little weird. It's always a little weird when you see those guys in their new new uh, kits for the first time. But. Nashville just keeps taking some of our players. They took Jaleel and Ibaba, and he's now with Columbus. Yeah. Jaleel must really like yellow. I, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. It must be his favorite color. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've, you know, first show since last playoffs, but I forgot how the playoffs went. So we're going to skip right over that. We're going to talk about 2022 since the season's already underway. That's yeah. why we waited so long. We figure if we wait long enough, we won't even have to talk about the playoffs. We can just go straight into the 2022 season. Uh, the Revs opened things up with a 2-2 draw in Portland on Saturday, took a point home from the defending Western Conference champions. Look, they also opened the 2021 season with a 2-2 draw away from home. At the Chicago Fire, that turned out pretty well. They ended up setting the single-season MLS points record. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I guess to, to kind of start things off, when you think about how last year went for this team, set the single-season MLS points record, won the first Supporter Shield in club history. As you come off a season like that, what should be the expectations for the 2022 New England Revolution? I think that the expectations for this group have been elevated, and that's what we've consistently heard from the players and coaches. They have a target on their back. They're no longer secretly a good team. They proved last year with a lot of the core returning that they're capable of having a season that's an MLS record um, with regards to points. And I think the standard this year has to be you're going to make a deep playoff run, and the goal is obviously MLS Cup. But I think a lot of the players this year are – a lot more hungry than they were at the end of last season with how it ended. It just ended so suddenly. There were such high hopes, and it really felt like – I'm sorry, we're now recapping the playoffs, which you yeah. didn't want to do. But it really <laughs> it really felt like last year could have been the year. So I think this year they're even more hungry. They want it even more badly. And, you know, they need to have to, a consistently strong season to get to that point. But I think it's got to be about finishing strong and getting that MLS Cup. 
Yeah, winning Shield last year was great. I'm really glad that we experienced winning yes. the Supporter Shield. That was something that this organization needed mm -hmm. to get that first league trophy, to have that moment together at Gillette Stadium to lift the Shield. It was fantastic. Uh, but I would gladly sacrifice another Supporter Shield for an MLS Cup, and I am sure that I am in the vast majority of people associated with the Revolution organization who feel that way. I actually saw... In a uh, heartbeat. <laughs> Grant, Grant Wall's predictions for the, uh, the 2022 season, his prediction was actually that the Revs were going to win the Supporter Shield again and again fall short of winning MLS Cup. And that would be, that's like worst case scenario for me. I think that would be absolutely devastating to be uh, in that position going into the playoffs for a second straight year until we can yeah. fall short. So for me, it's MLS, MLS Cup. That is the goal. I'm perfectly fine finishing like fourth in the Eastern Conference yep. and winning like New York City FC did last year. I'm cool as long as you're in the mix. Yeah. You have a good season. You get some wins piled up. You put yourself in a good position heading into the playoffs and you go on a playoff run and win MLS Cup. Like that's, that's, what, I, that's what I want at this point. Shield was great. That was awesome. Uh, for me, go out and win MLS Cup. Uh, I also feel like there is an opportunity though here in the early part of the season to really put a focus on CONCACAF Champions League mm -hmm. for a lot of different reasons. One, this is six games to a trophy. You go through your two-leg quarterfinals, two-leg semifinals, and a two-leg final, and you've got an opportunity to go three games on the road, three games at home, and lift not only lift a trophy, but lift a trophy that no other MLS team has ever list, lifted to win a continental championship, to claim a spot at the Club World Cup. Going out and winning a CONCACAF Champions League would be incredible. And you have the opportunity here in the first half of the season because this is a revolution team that is, is going to look a little bit different come the end of the season than it looks right now. We know that Matt Turner is going to be leaving come summertime as he joins Arsenal in the Premier League. You have Matt Turner through that run in the Champions League. Bruce Arena has been open about saying that he expects offers to come in for Adam Buxa. There's potential that Adam Buxa could end up being sold come summertime. But right now, you've got the majority of this squad together that went out and won Shield last year. You've got a chance to go make run at the a run at the Champions League, uh, and for me at least, that should be a, a pretty strong focus. You got a chance over these next few weeks to go out and, and try to win a trophy. Yeah, I think it for sure is a strong focus for this group. And from every player that we've talked to, and and there are some people who have played in Concacaf tournaments before, um, whether it's at the international or the club level. Like I know Omar Gonzalez has done it at the club level. Obviously, Turner, who you mentioned, has done it at the international stage, uh, to name a few. But for the majority of this group, they haven't played in this before, and they're all really excited. They're excited to do that international travel, travel to go to Mexico City and play a game. It's something that they haven't done before, and they're really like hungry for this new um, experience. And I think you're right. I think especially uh, with Turner leaving mid season um, and having that core of the group back from 2021 like this is kind of the time that they can put into a quick it, it won't be an easy road but it is a fast road like it is said, fast yeah like six <laughs> games to get a trophy so I think there's a lot of excitement around it and it's something that they're they're really gunning for um, I actually spoke with Bruce this morning and coffee with the coach so if you haven't watched that make sure you tune into it it was good a good conversation but he was talking about how over the next you know 15 15 days on starting on Saturday when they're playing five games there's going to be a lot of road because they need to keep players healthy um, and they, they want to perform well. And I, I'm going to have to go back because I'm going to be honest, I haven't seen the interview again since, but I'm pretty sure he was talking about having more of a for, first choice group for those CONCACAF games. Um, but he did say that the focus is on Saturday in the home opener and that's their first regard. But I think they are planning on putting out full force when it comes to CONCACAF. Yeah, the fact is, as a coaching staff, they are going to kind of have to make a, a little bit of a decision, yeah. like you said, because when you play five games in 15 days at this stage in the season, you have to rotate. You don't really have, I mean, you, you're going to rotate playing five games in 15 days at any point in the season, but particularly in March, as yep. guys are still building their fitness. You're going to have to use a lot of different bodies through those five games. And as a staff, you kind of do have to make a little bit of a decision. What do we want to prioritize here? When do we want to rotate a little bit more heavily? And you said it, it does sound like, at least based on your conversation with Bruce, that the idea is, look, we don't want to rotate too much for those Champions League games. We want to have out the strongest lineup we possibly can. And if that means that you've got to rest some guys on the weekend for the league games, then you do what you have to do because you're going to have 30 other opportunities to kind of get yourself you know, back in the mix. Uh, yeah. Not that you can't go out and win, and win games now, obviously, with, a, with your depth. The Revs did that consistently throughout yes. last year. But uh, you know that you've got a long MLS season in front of you. If you go out and you don't beat Pumas in the quarterfinals, then that run that competition's over. So you got to put your focus there uh, and make sure that you're putting everything into that competition. Um, 
we mentioned that the expectations, the expectations are obviously up. That's going to happen when you set the single season points record. Uh, there was some talk on the Fox broadcast on Saturday. They mentioned a lot of the teams who've set the single season points record or have gone out and won the supporter shield in recent years. There's been something like 20 to 30 point drop offs the following wow. season. It can be, yeah. it can be difficult, right? Obviously it's tough to go out and do this year after year. Well, yeah, first one I thought of was Toronto. Yeah. So they really fell off. They did. Uh, LAFC had a pretty significant it's drop true. off uh, the year after they set the single season points record. So it's difficult. So I guess my, my question is, you know, when you have those increased expectations, can that, can that be a detriment? You know, can that, can that hurt you coming off a year like that when you know that everybody is going to be gunning for you? Uh, I think it's a double-edged sword if I'm being totally honest because I can tell you that last year people, like on the team, the team held themselves to a high expectation and they kept themselves there for the majority of the year, but there was the drop-off with the playoffs. So um, I think with this group, and and, and to be honest, as I... I think, think we've all been with coaches in our in our lives, right? Like you've all played on a sports team. There's people that, you know, they respond well to having high expectations, like they go to meet them and they're people that get nervous and fall short. But I do think what we've seen from a large majority from this group is that they are a team that plays up to those expectations. Like they hold themselves to a high standard. They want to elevate themselves to it. And when people hold themselves to it outside of the organization, they want to play up to it. So I do think that this group does respond well to having those high expectations. Don't get me wrong. They like surpassing them too. But I think that they're able to kind of play up to that Um, and I think in their heads for the past few months they've known the expectations are high so I don't think it's a moment where you know like the expectations are raised and you choke I think they know this is how it's going to operate they they know exactly what's happening they know Turner's leaving mid-year they know they're going to have to shift things they know there's going to be changes Um, so I think there's been a lot of transparency with the expectations and I do think that this group has the ability to play up to them yeah the x factor for me is Bruce yeah I don't think that Bruce Arena coach teams ever have any issues with expectations. I just don't think Bruce allows his teams to even think about or mm-hmm. consider expectations. And it's funny because as you hear a lot of these statistics of like, well, you know, it's really tough to repeat. No one's done it since, you know, the galaxy in 11 and 12. And, and well, I was a Bruce Arena coach team. No one's <laughs> won back to back supporter shields since, you know, I don't know, 13 and 14. It's like, okay, well that was, you know, 12 and 13. And that was Bruce Arena coach teams. Like every time we talk about, well, it's really hard to be consistent year over year. No one's done that since Bruce Arena. So you're like, okay, well, I guess it helps that you've got Bruce Arena leading the charge uh, in those situations. And, and Bruce and his staff went out and made some additions to this group to bolster their squad for the 2022 season. They made six additions in the offseason. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll just ask generally to start here, just thoughts on the six offseason signings that the Revs made to bolster this group heading into the new campaign. Yeah, and Jeff, I know we've talked about this uh, off of the podcast, but you really do have them kind of set into two different groups. You have the bigger signings with Sebastian Legette, Omar Gonzalez, and and Josie Altador, who I think all three of them are going to play really important minutes for this group. Like, you needed depth um, at at all of those positions, truthfully. I think Legette is going to be probably competing for the most, not competing for, playing the most minutes on the field. I think he's going to be able to make a really big impact. And you saw that as early as that game in Portland with that goal and how he was able to uh, facilitate all of that. And then I think with Josie Altidore, you mentioned the question pending Buxa. If he's here in the middle of the year, you're going to need someone who can slot in, who knows the system, who's going to be able to operate. And Altidore has a record of success under Bruce Arena in multiple categories at the club and international level. So I think he He's going to be, uh, as he's, he's still getting his fitness up right now, but I do think that later on the season, he's going to be a really, and, and now, but later on the season, he's going to be even more important to this group. Um, and Omar Gonzalez, I think that he did a great job in the opener as well. And that center back position, we needed depth at it. And I think that he's someone that is going to bring a lot of leadership. Um, and he also is just physically big in stature when you look at him, like <laughs> watching him on the field. Super he, tall. Yeah, he towers over everybody. So I think that's um, an advantage that he does bring uh, Uh, as well, even though he is a little bit more of a veteran um, and and is an older player. But you look at some of these younger guys that have been brought in, uh, Jacob Jackson, Noel Buck, to just name two of them. Um, They're all so eager and just just really, really exciting. Ryan Spaulding as well. Um, So I think there's those two categories. It's going to be exciting to watch both of them grow, but obviously you're going to have your three primary contributors with the first trio that I discussed. Yeah, everybody looks big to me, but Omar Gonzalez (laughs) looks really big to me. (laughs) 
I did not expect him to be that tall when, when he first walked in. I my, was like, oh, wow. My first interview I did with him, uh, our our uh, producer, Curtis, um, he set up a box for me to stand on <laughs> so that the height difference wasn't so drastic. And, you know, we were talking with Omar about it before we started the interview. And he goes, honestly, I appreciate you standing on the box because it hurt my neck to be talking down <laughs> like this and looking at you. Yeah, straight in with the jokes right off the bat. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Um, but, yeah, he's, he's really tall, can confirm. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I mean, you can see that this Bruce Arena and his staff are clearly still planning for the future with signings like Noel Buck, a 16-year-old homegrown player coming in who they have high expectations for down the line, a first-round super draft pick and Jacob Jackson coming in and, and hopefully molding him into a goalkeeper for the future. But for me, really, when you're focusing on Gonzalez, Altador, and Legette, like these are three win-now moves. Oh, yeah. You know, Sebastian Legette's 29 years old. Altador and Gonzalez are both in their 30s. These are both guys who want to come in and win now. They all have championship pedigree. They've all played with Bruce before. They, they know exactly what they're doing coming to New England and trying to help play roles and get this team over the hump and to win a championship. And I think that's Bruce's mindset as well because, look, I know Bruce just signed a multi-year contract extension with the team, but he joked in the season preview on WBZ. He's like, look, I don't, I never know how long I'm going to be anywhere. He's, <laughs> he's like, I'm 70 years old. I don't know how long I'm going to yeah. keep coaching. Like He understands that that window to win is now. And there's an opportunity to go out and win with this Revolution team now. And Legette, Altador, and Gonzalez are all players playing different positions on the field and playing different roles within this group. But all guys brought in to help this team win immediately. Um, we saw Sebastian Legette have a fantastic debut, uh, scoring a great goal on Saturday. Um, he's uh, that's, that's what Bruce Arena wants to see from Sebastian Legette, yeah. is getting forward, getting involved in the attack. He, he, you know, he felt like he had to get away from that a little bit in recent years in LA because they had him playing a bunch of different positions, but he wants to be an attack minded player. He wants to get forward. I think he's still kind of, he's, he's programming himself to know that that's exactly what this team wants from him. But you can see when he gets forward and he gets into those positions, he can be really, really dangerous. And if Josie Altador is coming in to play the role that he says he's coming into play and his, his role right now is to come in and just be a piece of a really dynamic attack and say, look, I'll come off the bench if I need to. I'll give you 15 minutes or 20 minutes here and there. I'll give you a spot start. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to help make that attack better. Then Josie Altador can be an absolutely tremendous addition for this team in 2022 and years to come after that as well. I think that's my favorite part about him uh, signing with us is that like sometimes you get these players that come in with the championship pedigree and you know it, people can have egos or you know they they say I'm, I'm going to be a starter and I just love that he is willing to accept whatever role and has been very vocal if it's like 15 minutes off the bench I'm, I'm in. Yep. Yep. Well all three of uh, Legette, Gonzalez, and Altador they all debuted on Saturday in Portland. So did Goalkeeper Earl Edwards Jr. He was not a newcomer to the team. He was on the squad last year, but it was his Revolution debut. He made three absolutely massive saves in that 2-2 draw with the Timbers. Uh, and that was not only his first start with the Revs, it was his first start in MLS since 2018. We will talk about that with Earl momentarily. He will join us for the first time on the Far Post Podcast presented by Esports Gaming League. Welcome back to the Far Post Podcast presented by eSports Gaming League. We are absolutely thrilled to be joined now by, I believe, a first-time guest on the Far Post Podcast, Earl Edwards Jr., who was a standout performer in his Revolution debut, a 2-2 draw with the Portland Timbers last weekend. Earl, thank you so much for taking the time to join the show. Thanks for having me, and I appreciate the con words. It's uh, definitely my first time on the show, and I hope there's more to come. Well, uh, we're going to talk about your performance individually, because obviously that was uh, a big storyline on Saturday night. But I want to start just by talking about the team in general, because you guys kicked off the season Saturday in Portland. You go on the road. You take a point away from the defending Western Conference champions. I know a lot of guys talked about that game afterwards, said it was it was a grind. It was a battle. It's kind of what you expect every time you go to Portland. So I just want to get your general thoughts on the team's performance to start the season and taking a point home. Yeah, I think across the board for me... Um there were a few new experiences that I had had. Um, I hadn't played against a game since 2018, um, and it was definitely the first time I was playing in an opening game of an MLS season. Um, so just the mentality of that going into it um, was interesting, you know, for me trying to figure out, obviously, this is our first step as a team going into the season. So understanding that there, um, there might be some rust and we're going to have to work through some things. Um, to a lot of the players' points, we did have to uh, grind out a point there, and I think we did a, a great job to do so. Um, but very much so with the understanding it's, it's one of 34. It's going to be a long season. 
um, a lot of really strong points to take from that game to try to build off of and continue to have a good season. Did that kind of up the intensity too? I mean, obviously for you, you mentioned it's the first start in a few years. You're at Providence Park where the atmosphere is always huge. It's the season opener. It's on national TV. Was that kind of all swirling around as you're walking around to kick off that game? Yeah, I, and that stuff's, uh, you know, it's hard to ignore what's going on around the game. Um, but for me, more than anything, um, my brother and dad were in town, and I was really, uh, it, was, it was a good thing for me to have them there and spend time with them the night before, the morning of, um, and just kind of feel at home. I really felt prepared going into the game. Um, more than anything, I even joked after the game, not playing a game since 2018, it gave me a ton of time to prepare. Uh, so um, I felt nothing but that. I felt really confident going into it. Um, and then, you know, being a nationally televised game, all that kind of stuff, when you step out for warm-ups, it's really hard to even be paying attention to all that. Everyone's kind of focused on their job, and um, everyone went out and I think uh, put in a really good performance. How far did your family travel to come watch you play? Not crazy far. My brother is, he lives right near uh, Cal Berkeley, um, and my dad's down in San Diego. So West Coast guys and made the trip easy. Everything worked out uh, perfectly, actually. That's awesome. Now, were they able to plan that trip because they knew you were starting? How far in advance did you know that you were going to be getting the start on Saturday? And how did you kind of mentally prepare once you officially got that news you were getting the start? Yeah, I think it was, um, it seemed a little more obvious as we got into this, the final week leading up to the game um, and just started to put uh, kind of feelers out in terms of letting them know. And it's a possibility. They were looking at flights and um, they kind of waited last minute, just waiting for confirmation and things of that sort. But um, again, being so close allowed them to hop on a flight last minute and, and be there for me. You mentioned it was, it was your first MLS start since 2018, Con coincidentally. That last start was while you were playing for Orlando against the Revs. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a lot of focus on, on you and your individual performance. And you mentioned after the game, you try to stay as level-headed as you possibly can. There was that one moment where you make the, the kick save on Jimmy Chara and then Farrell makes the follow-up block and you kind of let the emotion come out a little bit there. But how, how do you in those moments specifically, specifically with everything going on Saturday, like how do you kind of keep yourself level in moments like that? And are you usually successful at kind of keeping yourself level-headed? Yeah, for the most part, uh, I do feel I'm successful at, at doing that. Um, I, more than anything, playing in that in, in an environment like that in general, I think you see across the league, there's a lot of um, stadiums across the league now where the environments are, are close to Portland. Portland might be the standard in our league. It's obviously um, a, a stadium that has a sell, sell out, sold out crowd for, I think, years to come. So uh, obviously that's kind of a pinnacle, but I think a lot of – um, clubs across the league have similar atmospheres. Um, and I, I genuinely, and I've uh, voiced this to my dad and brother too, I, I really feel at home in those environments and I, I, I feel um, like it's what I was meant to do. Um, so when I'm in that environment, I, I, when I say I'm level-headed, I just, I, again, I feel confident and comfortable being um, between the lines and playing in those, in those circumstances. So um, I try to focus on what my job and my task is on um, any given play and ready for the next play. So I, I think I'd do my best to stay level-headed and focus on the task at hand. And you kind of had to do that for a long time because you're getting minutes with Revolution 2. Obviously, I know you were playing with Loudoun United. You're getting minutes with Orlando City B through all of these stops. But you waited quite a while to get that next MLS opportunity. So how do you kind of how do you kind of keep grinding through a stretch like that? How do you kind of keep your head up and know that if you keep working, that next opportunity is going to come? Yeah, no, that's a very loaded question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a loaded question, and it's one that – it didn't come easy or wasn't something that I, uh, you know, over the last four years, um, it wasn't like I had this all figured out and over the next, I don't know how long of time until I get my, my next game, I'm going to do X, Y, Z and I'll be perfectly ready. Um, it was very much so um, adapting on the fly, um, doing a lot of mental strength training with a, a dear friend of mine, Quincy Marroqua, um, and uh, uh, working with him over a couple years time extremely closely um, help me prepare mentally for um, being ready for a moment like this and then understanding um, different ways to work uh, mentally and physically. Um, and uh, as new things and challenges arise, uh, how to adapt and, and navigate those situations. And I think all of it's kind of culminated to me um, being ready and confident going into a season like this where it's unexpected to be called upon, but again, um, feeling ready and prepared um, to complete the task at hand. Yeah, I'd imagine there's one or two ups and downs over a stretch like that, right? A little yeah. bit of a roller coaster. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> uh, what, one of the highs that I think you probably experienced on Saturday, correct me if I'm wrong, you have a, a daughter, London, who's almost three, 
Yes. And then an infant son, Brooks. And there was a photo posted on social media of your daughter watching you on TV, you know, pointing at daddy on the screen. What was that like for you when you got off the field and you saw that photo? No, it was amazing. The funny thing, like, I uh, I think it was AJ De La Garza. He did it last year. And, and uh, I saw that and was just like, man, I really hope I get my moment sooner than later for my kids to be able to appreciate what I do. And, you know, every morning my daughter asks me where I'm going and, Aww. I've gotten to the point now where I'm telling her, where do you think I'm going? And she says, soccer ball. And uh, we have a little bit of that rapport. But for her to, to see it, I asked my wife, I said, hey, if she's up late enough to watch the game, um, do you mind taking a picture or recording? I didn't know she was going to go public with it. I just <laughs> wanted to be able to see her appreciate that myself because obviously that's kind of who I'm providing for in my job. So um, to see that and see her appreciate it um, was extremely fulfilling for me. My wife's a little upset. She was in her pajamas, with that. <laughs> and it happened, to, it happened to spread quite a bit. But uh, now, a really cool moment for me and my family. What was the moment like for you when you got home and you got to see your kids? Like, did they kind of put everything together? What did that moment mean to you when you got to kind of come home and tell them about it in person? <laughs> well, I'm laughing because we landed at about 5:30 a.m. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's nice to obviously be doing charter flights uh, in our current environment, um, but we got home at 5:30 and. We had a bit of a snowstorm come through while we were gone, and so guys are digging out their cars, and uh, I live a little further south than most guys, so by the time I got home, it was about 6, 6.30 a.m., uh, my daughter was just waking up as I was trying to go back to sleep, <laughs> uh, but as I woke up, she was more than anything just excited to see me. Um, I still think she's a little too young to have, um, you know, put it all together, but I started asking her questions about seeing daddy on TV, and um, she said, yeah, and immediately asked me, like, you came back. I said, yeah, I came back. <laughs> uh, Surprise. Yeah, so, uh, but it, I could tell she, she did recall me being on the TV and then obviously Aww. putting together that I'm now home. Um, but it was cool. I do think I, I'm excited as she gets older to, to grasp it in a, um, in, in more detail, but, uh, yeah, it was a cool moment just to be home and, uh, to see that she did have some of that appreciation is cool. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, I appreciate it. It was absolutely adorable. Hopefully you do have many more of those moments. And I know you've, you've got a lot going on off the field, obviously family being the number one priority, but you're also a co-founder of Black Players for Change. You were just recently elected president of that organization. So congratulations on your election. You. Yes, congrats. Appreciate so it. I just wanted to ask kind of what, what was your reaction because you were elected by your peers. So what was your reaction to the news that you'd been elected president and that it was your peers who'd put you in that position? Yeah, working with the BPC in general, um, I took a step back last year as we um, came out of the Orlando bubble. We did our demonstration there, and um, we're really getting our organization off the ground. And I, I had a word with my wife just trying to explain to her, like, I, I've never done something like this, that it's providing a fulfillment in my life that I've never experienced. Um, so it's it's something when I when we get a year plus down the road and to have my peers recognize the work I've done with the group um, and want me to be one of the leaders of the group and, and to be elected for such a position um, was like, I was really in awe of the whole moment. Um, I, I called a lot of people <laughs> um, and a lot of people called me as well. And it's just something that was extremely humbling. It was, it's truly an honor to be a, elected a leader of our organization and um, the guys we have around us as other board members. Um, I respect the hell out of them and um, I, I, extremely grateful to be in the position I am. You know, BPC was formed just a, a little under two years ago, so it's, it's very early days, but you've been hard at work since day one, and there's mm -hmm. been a lot going on with that organization. So maybe this is a, a loaded question, and you're probably not going to have enough time to fully answer it, but in, in what ways do you feel like, just through these first couple of years, that BPC has already been able to make a, a difference in the early going? Yeah, I think, um, and our goal from the start was to make a difference in our, in our local communities that uh, across the league, and then... Um, try to make as big an impact and, and shift of uh, the culture within our league as well. Um, so to look back at last year and um, to be one of the people directly working on our the new diversity initiative, um, that policy, and then um, I look at what we've done uh, across the league in our local communities and to, to um, reflect on the, the deal we have with U.S. Soccer Foundation um, and Musco Lighting to – build out uh, 12 mini pitches in collaboration with the Black Women's Players uh, Collective. Um, you know, we are making an impact in the community. I've gotten to see a couple of those uh, courts or pitches uh, firsthand and um, to see what it's going to provide for those communities and providing that access and bridging those gaps. Um, very much so uh, a very strong starting point for how we want to um, impact change in, uh, for years to come. But um, 
very proud of the foundation we've laid, and I think this is a year that you'll continue to see things um, that we've built out and projects we're working on that um, we'll continue to do things in that in that fashion. And um, I don't know if you guys have seen, but we are doing this blackout collection jersey again, and um, we've just announced that on our socials and, and things of that sort. And um, it's just another great collaboration to, to raise money, this one specifically for our organization, to continue to push the needle. Yeah, what can people do there in terms of potentially acquiring one of those jerseys like just give us a little bit of the details on the blackout collection yeah I, all the details are on our on our socials and on our website if, if anyone's interested and then um but specifically it's it's more of a raffle um you can enter as many times as you like the the money uh, does go to our organization and we're gonna actually um we're collaborating with the bwpc on this as well so it's it's to fund our organization and theirs um and to to be doing something in collaboration with the, the women's organization that's as powerful as theirs is um, also very humbling for us, and it's something we're excited to do. So um, I highly encourage everyone to check out our social media channels and, and get involved. There's obviously a ton going on right now. I'm sure that's where most of the focus is. But as president, I'm sure you kind of think about the future as well. I mean, do you have an idea of kind of what's what's next for BPC, kind of what the, the main areas of focus are as you kind of want to move into the, the coming weeks and months? Yeah, I think um, – the biggest things for us moving forward, uh, we're going to continue to have a, a really strong focus around Juneteenth um, and around that month in general. So uh, there's some things that we want to do around then, and I think that's probably the most uh, following this blackout collection, something that our group is doing specifically um, that people will be paying attention to. And uh, I encourage people to pay attention to it's uh, We do some fun stuff around that time, and it was around our uh, – that's when we got started as well. So – um, that um, around the all-star break and stuff towards the end of the year around the MLS Cup as well. Those are kind of uh, key dates throughout the year that we try to focus and um, do some strong initiatives, but there's going to be stuff in between. And um, thankfully, we've had a lot of great organizations that want to do similar work, reach out to us and work with us. Um, so those things continue to pop up and we uh, are very open to working with organizations. I want to move the needle in this field and it's something that I know uh, there's going to be projects that pop up throughout the year that are exciting. We'll adapt on the fly and incorporate as many as we can. Yeah, one other way you're impacting the local community here in New England, you're a big part of the Revolution Players Collaborative Fund, which distributes $20,000 bi-monthly, that money donated generously by the Kraft family. Uh, and what you've been doing, at least in recent months, is splitting that $20,000 into a pair of $10,000 donations. I believe you're actually, uh, I think it's today, you're going to be surprising a couple more of the, the donors. Uh, just tell us about uh, this upcoming uh, donor recipients. Have you got any information on who's going to be receiving these donors? Yeah, I don't uh, <laughs> necessarily want to... <laughs> put it out there directly before we speak to them. But I will say uh, it's organizations that are in similar fields. Um, and, uh, you know, we've done research on, I, I think we've looked at about 14 to 16 different organizations that we're looking at donating to over the next year or so. Um, and we've put a great amount of thought into that. And each each uh, time we do select uh, two of these organizations to donate to, there is a there's a fair amount of players that we sit down and we take the time and talk about why uh, we feel passionate about um, do, uh, donating to these specific organizations and it's not something that's you know strictly the crafts throwing a name at us and we pop on a call and there is thought and dedication and commitment uh, behind it and the players are bought in we're thankful that the crafts have uh, uh, been open to doing something of the sort um, and it's something again that we've been bought into and hope it's something we can continue to do for years to come You've been on a few of these calls, too, where you've let the recipients know that they're receiving these donations. What's that like actually getting to kind of see their faces the moment that they're finding out they're getting this $10,000? It's amazing, actually. Uh, uh, I think um, Brandon Bai is going to hop on one of the calls today or in for the meeting today. I was just explaining to him that, uh, you know, it's cool because they don't know we're going to be on the call to start. Uh, That's awesome. It's really cool. So it's uh, we pop on. You can tell immediately they're like, what is this? Because I did not expect this. Um, but they kind of go into explaining the background of their organizations and it's kind of turned over to us as players to then present them with the donation. So, um, they're blindsided by that as well. So to be blindsided, to see the players are excited about that. And then to have us as players present them with uh, such a grant is something that, um, you know, typically it's a blown away reaction and, um, it's really satisfying for us to be able to provide that for them and, um, to hear about the great work that they're doing, in, uh, in our community and, for us to be a part of that in, in a small form of, of uh, financial payment is something that it's, you know, that goes a long way. And it's exciting to be donating to organizations that uh, have such a strong impact. Right, well, Earl, we know you appreciate the work they're doing in the community. We appreciate the work you're doing in the community as well. Also appreciate you taking the time to stop by and join the Far Post podcast today. Hopefully we'll be talking to you 
again soon. Yeah, of course. I hope it's not the last time, that's for sure. That is Earl Edwards Jr. We'll be right back on the Far Post podcast presented by Esports Gaming League. Welcome back to the Far Post podcast presented by Esports Gaming League. Absolutely fantastic to have Earl Edwards Jr. on the show. Uh, Great guest who's doing so much in the community. And uh, I'm glad that his performance on Saturday not only brought a little light to uh, his ability as a goalkeeper, but I think it's going to bring a little bit of light to what he's doing off the field as well. Um, So a little bit of an added benefit of Earl getting that start on Saturday and performing the way that he did. And the fact is Earl could could potentially have a big role to play on this club moving forward. You know, we talked about it earlier on the show. We know Matt Turner is going to Arsenal come summertime. Bruce Arena has said that the Revs are going to use these next few months to determine the future of the goalkeeping position in New England. They need to decide whether the goalkeeper of the future is one of the three guys they have on the roster beyond Matt Turner and Earl Edwards, Brad Knighton, and Jacob Jackson, or if they need to look outside the organization to bring someone in to be a starter moving forward. And, you know, Earl got an opportunity on Saturday. Who knows how many of those opportunities he's going to get, but he certainly made a case for himself with the way that he performed on Saturday. And if he gets some more of those opportunities and he performs the way he did, going to be tough potentially to take Earl Edwards off the field. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that he was phenomenal in the season opener. And I know that he did concede two goals, but Bruce Arena was the first one to say there was not anything that he really could have done in those situations. But you saw him locked in from the very start of the game. And for somebody who's getting, you know, as he talked about, his first MLS opener in a really hostile environment in Portland, to be able to perform at that level in that situation when you're called upon, I think he made a great, great start for a case for himself. And then doing kind of a similar thing in the second half too, in I think it was the 46 minute, another big save to kind of keep, keep the revs uh, in, in a good position. So I think he started a really great case for himself and you know, he might have an opportunity. We don't know to continue to build that for a, another game or two. And we will have to find out, especially with the depth and the rotation that arena was talking about. Um, but I am excited to see more from him and what he can do. And to be honest, I know last year the order was Turner, Knighton, Earl Edwards Jr. Um, But I don't know, maybe he's challenged Knighton at this point for that second spot. I I think there's some definite competition there. And I think Bruce and the coaching staff are going to have a lot of things to think about. But I think Earl Edwards Jr. is for sure going to be in that conversation. Yeah, got his opportunity and uh, and certainly grasped hold of it. And I think that the save that he made in the fifth minute, I think was so huge for him. It's a point blank save that he makes. And... You never want to concede a point blank chance five minutes into your season opener. Obviously, that's not the idea. But I think for Earl, in that moment, with all of those emotions swirling around, mentioned walking out in his first start in three and a half years, it being in Portland with that atmosphere and the rain and the season opener, national TV and all that, for him to go out and have everything kind of swirling through him and then make this massive save five minutes into the game. I feel like it's just got to settle you down a little bit and just give you that that little boost that maybe needed to be like, all right, I'm good. This is, this is where I belong. And now I'm, now I'm settled in and locked in. Um, and he said after the game that he felt like that save uh, ended up being a big, a big save for him to make. Um, and we'll, we'll get into this. I'm sure much more on future shows as we get closer and closer, uh, to Matt Turner's departure later this summer. But, um, I mean, how cool, like this story is just so absurd. The fact that Matt Turner, started where he did, you know, even before he joined the Revs, the whole, you know, not playing soccer seriously until he was like 15, 16 years old, and then going to Fairfield, uh, not really having a whole lot of opportunities to go play D1 college soccer, and having very limited professional opportunities after that, and to, to carve the path that he has carved, to now be going to play in the Premier League for his childhood, his favorite childhood team <laughs> come later this summer. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, uh, it's absurd. It's ridiculous. The whole the whole story. Yeah, I mean Matt Turner's story uh, from day one has always been a little like crazy in an exciting way. But to see it, you know, write its next chapter in this way after everything that he's been through, you know, being undrafted, being the number three, uh, kind of getting his you know Cinderella story as that number one spot and just showing what he can do year after year and and growing to the national team um, to to win. Uh, Oh, but to win in CONCACAF too. It's just, um, it's been so exciting to watch. And I think one of the things too about Matt Turner that I don't know if people fully understand is like, he's, he's a good person and he's just a really good guy to have around this team. 
team. Um, and he has been, even as like the third string. I remember that was my first season that I started. And he was so nice to me. And I just remember thinking, wow, well, I'm the I'm the new girl here. The, probably the only female that's really around this team right now. And, and you're being so kind to me. That's so nice. And then he goes and gets that, gets that opportunity. And he's just continued to grow since. Um, but he also just always, when he sees you, he asks how you're doing. He, he genuinely cares. Um, and he, he shows that around Christmas time, if it's like a card or a gift or whatever. Like he, he always shows that he cares. And I am so thrilled for him to be getting this new opportunity. And I know that what happens in Arsenal, he's going to be successful. Uh, he, he might have to climb his way through the ranks, but I would not be surprised if at some point we're hearing that Turner is the number one keeper there uh, in, in a few years. Um, but I'm thrilled for him. It's going to be a really exciting next chapter, and I can't wait to see his success. It's funny because uh, when Matt Turner started with the team, you mentioned he was a third string goalkeeper, and you always have these guys on the roster who, when we used to actually do events in person and do charity events and visits to different places, there's usually this roster of guys yeah. who aren't playing as many first team minutes. And the way that we end up interacting with them the most is going to these events, whether yeah. it's an event at a bar or like, I remember Matt Turner going to the Foxborough fire station and we went and did a tour of the fire station. And, um, you know, we're not interviewing those players a ton talking about the games on the weekend because yeah. they're not seeing a ton of minutes. So where we really interact with them is through all of these events that they go to. So that's really how we kind of got to know Matt Turner, was it going to all of these charitable events and interviewing him about these charitable opportunities, and then to see him go from that to just continue to work his way up the ranks uh, to now be, to be going on to Arsenal later this summer. Um, it's, a, it's absolutely ridiculous. But he remains in New England now. Obviously, we mentioned uh, on Saturday, um, he's on Saturday missed the game because he was resting a minor foot injury. Uh, hope that Matt's going to be back on the field very, very soon. Uh, and the Revs will have him through June or so uh, before he heads off to Arsenal. But uh, hopefully Matt can host us in London at some point. That'll yeah. be, oh, that'll, totally. that'll be my totally. plan. Just, I already made it very clear. That <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, he's a, he's a great person and it's been exciting to watch him uh, climb through the ranks. I feel like I remember seeing him um, at a charity event one time. He was like signing an autograph and this little, he asked like this little girl, like, what's your, had a conversation with her while he was signing the autograph and was like, what's your favorite, favorite position? And uh, I think she said, uh, I think she said, uh, like she liked to like score goals and he was like, Oh, I like that too. And then she said, what's your position? Cause you know, like, you know, I don't yeah, know. How she doesn't know who Matt Turner is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's, she's little like, and this is somewhat recently. And he goes, Oh, I like, uh, I, I'm the goalie. I, I'm, I play goalkeeper. And she goes, I don't like that. I don't want to get hit by soccer balls, but like that, and like, you <laughs> smart know, girl. A, True. A smart girl, but that, uh, that innate ability to like have those little conversations, even as he has grown so much and like really yeah. add that he human element. I feel like he's someone who stayed pretty level headed and has continued to be really kind to fans and, and goes that extra mile. So I think that's going to be exciting to watch him too carry that over to Arsenal. Yeah, looking forward to seeing what Matt Turner does down the road and also here in New England over the coming months. But uh, the Revs are back in action Saturday afternoon, the home opener at Gillette Stadium. They're kicking off against FC Dallas at 1.30 p.m. Hopefully we will see everybody there as we get fans back to Foxborough. Uh, just one question about this weekend. Uh, interesting over the course of the past two years because of the way the pandemic shook out and limited travel and regional competition the Reds have played two games against western conference teams over the entirety of 2020 and 2021 they're going to play three western conference teams to open the 2022 season <laughs> starting in portland yeah. and then home against dallas and real salt lake so that's three western conference games in the span that you know they that's more western conference teams than they played in the past two years combined uh, do you do you like getting back to the interconference play uh and, and getting to see some western conference opponents rather than montreal toronto red bull and philadelphia over and over and over again yes very much so i think it's exciting to have other teams in the mix um and it's funny because you know we played fc dallas last year actually but it was at toyota stadium yeah, yeah. so this is a team that we've seen twice uh, in the last two seasons which is unusual given they like you said they only played two western games last year and now they have eight this year but i do like it i almost wish they were a little more spread out look forward to different yeah, things there will be eight games against western conference team and three of them you're getting yeah. out of the way right off the bat yeah but I do think it's a, a nice uh, shake up to have some of that more in the mix this season yeah I don't think the league is ever going back to you know a split schedule where you're playing no. every single western conference team I think you're definitely going to see something that settles into really similar to what the schedule looks like this year where you've got what 26 games against your conference opponents and eight games against the other conference I think that's probably where the league ends up um 
But I do, I do like that opportunity to play some of those Western Conference teams. Like, I don't want, you know, already Austin played last season. They don't play the Revs this year. Like, at some point, I want the Revs to be able to go to Austin and play against Austin yeah. FC. Like, I don't want there to be these teams and atmospheres in the league that the Revs never experience because they're in the Western Conference. So I do like that they're getting back to that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, and I think I, I think part of the product for why they won't go back to for, for one of many factors why they won't go back to that you know playing every team um, every Western team every year is because now there's just so many teams in the league like yeah there's been so many additions it, the, a 34 game schedule doesn't allow you to play every Western Conference opponent and then every Eastern uh, opponent twice like it used to home and away so I think that's another product of why they're going to have to kind of reshape how they're looking at things and I know the eight games this year is a product of COVID and you know travel and kind of figuring out things since things were regional last year but I, I think adding teams is a big component to why they won't go back to it yeah, you've got St. Louis coming in as team 29 next year Don Garber has been very open yep. about Las Vegas, hopefully coming in as Team 30 My beyond word. that. And then he That's has wild. said that they are currently in discussions as to whether they would like to expand to 32 beyond that. He said he believes that MLS can handle it. Uh, long ago the days, I think I think when I joined the league, there were 15 teams in the league. <laughs> has it basically doubled the size of the league since I joined? I, I think it was 10 when I started. Yeah. That was, that was only two years before <laughs> you. So. Yeah. Yeah, their, their expansion has been rapid but yeah it, it basically does mm -hmm. create a situation where you're not going to play we, we had years in this league we played everybody home and away oh yeah, yeah. we're not doing that anymore uh, but yeah you got to play some western conference teams every now and then just to get some of those matches in there but we'll uh, we'll look forward to that game on saturday against fc dallas also looking forward to as we mentioned earlier in the show the scotia bank concacaf champions league that quarterfinal matchup with pumas of liga mx the home leg is set for wednesday march 9th at 8 p.m., tickets are on sale now. So get to revolutionsoccer.net. Make sure that you're getting your tickets for that match. It's a really fun competition. Meetings against Mexican teams can get really heated. We saw a ton of them at Gillette <laughs> Stadium back between 2008 and 2010 in Superliga, uh, including one against Pumas in which Zach Shalosky scored the game-winning goal in a 1-0 Revs win. Some trivia for you. So uh, get your tickets for that match. And also tickets on sale for Saturday's home opener against FC Dallas. That game, again, kicks off at 1.30 p.m. So get yourself out to Foxborough. Hopefully we will see you then, and we'll see you soon on the Far Post podcast presented by eSports Gaming League.